such a skill action. You know in the book of Revelation when it mentions <coughs> the wheel? The wheel with the eyes in the wheel, is it? Ezekiel. From Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Yeah. Ezekiel. Yeah, what, what is that referring to? Is it, yeah, in Ezekiel with the eyes in the wheel? Is that yeah. Like, what's that referring to? It, it refers to what's in the book of Revelation. The divine presence and, and, and the Holy Spirit. But it is uh, one of the most mysterious passages of Scripture. Yeah. Some people have gotten a hold of it and tried to make it into a UFO theology, yeah. <laughs> which is absolutely <laughs> crazy. It's stuff. not yeah. that. It's not that. But when you see, we, the, the eye, with, like in Revelation, the, the creature with all the eyes, the eyes of the right, yeah. it means the all seeing presence of God and nature of God. That's, that's, that's essentially what it means. The wheel, obviously, it came down, and God was looking at what was happening. And then Ezekiel got the vision. Um, now, it's much more complicated than that, and I don't fully understand it yet, but that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Remember, the wheel came down, and it was moving, and, and, and Ezekiel was in Babylon at the time, yeah. which would have been really, um, you know, for a Jew to understand, like, well, we're not in the promised land. God's always in the promised land. Well, he was in Babylon. God was with them. Yes. And the wheel had moved. The presence of God was there with them. So he, they were not strange from God's presence. So that's also, the idea of the wheel meant mobility. You know, it meant mobility. Yeah. Ezekiel lived under the promise of the return to the land. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. God will return them back. Thank bring you. them yes. back. Yes. Yeah. Probably the most difficult, one of the most difficult chapters in all the yes. Bible is that part of Ezekiel. Thank you so much, you two, for a Thank fantastic you. conference. Uh, my, my question is about uh, persevering. He that endures to the end shall be saved. In the light of the fact that the Apostle Peter said to Jesus, you can rely on me, I'll never let you down, don't worry. Uh, how could we be confident of our salvation? Uh, how can we be confident that we will endure to the end? Okay. <laughs> we can always be sure of our salvation at the present time. <laughs> we can also be sure that if we begin to deviate from the way of the Lord, the Holy Spirit will convict us. And we can be sure that if we do not repent once convicted, he will bring some kind of correction into our lives. That's right. The Lord does not save people to lose them. This, now you're saved, now you're not, thing comes from Roman Catholicism. They needed it to sell indulgences and so forth, but it's not scriptural. On the other hand, <clears throat> eternal security is not unconditional. It is conditional. The passage I always look at, however, is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where you had a believer who went into gross immorality and was given over to Satan that his soul might be saved. The Lord will actually give an unrepentant believer over to the devil to the destruction of his flesh rather than let him be eternally lost to scare them into repentance. I know of a case where that happened with a child who went to university and fell away from the Lord and then came back home with HIV infection and AIDS. And the Lord used that to get her to repent. It was terrible, but I know of a couple of cases where things like that have happened. I'm sure Marco does as a pastor. Um, the Lord does not like to save people in order to lose them. He does not like to save people in order to lose them. The perseverance of the saints has been perverted out of all reasonable context, in fact, grossly out of context, by Calvinists. The term only occurs essentially two places in the scripture. Look with me to Revelation chapter 14. Verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. It is those believers who in the face of the onslaught of Antichrist will not deny Christ. It's a prophecy. Do I believe in perseverance of the saints? Absolutely, as the scripture teaches it. It's a prophetic truth about believers at a coming time. 
we find the same thing in Revelation 13, the Antichrist chapter. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. That is what the scripture calls perseverance of the saints. The Calvinists have given it a completely different definition of their own that has no resemblance to what the scripture defines it as being. To them it means unconditional, once saved, always saved. That is not what the New Testament means by perseverance. So do I believe in perseverance? Of course, it's in scripture. Does that mean unconditional, once saved, always saved? No, it does not. On the other hand, the Lord does not save people to lose them. While I do not believe in perseverance of the saints in the Calvinistic sense, I do believe in the perseverance of the Lord who leaves the 99 for the one, that he will bring correction to the life of a believer and even in extreme circumstances, judgment into the life of a believer to get them to repent. He doesn't like to lose what he has saved. Okay, does that answer the question? A lot of times, and I would just like to add, I don't think anything he's added to Jacob too much, but uh, like the fact that in the New Testament, there's always, God's always calling his people to himself. And the only thing that we have to do is respond to that. Uh, God loves us. He wants us to love him back. He calls us. We call him. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, Jude says, building yourself up and keeping yourself in the, in, in, in the love of God and yet that very context is talking about he who's able to keep you from stumbling. There's a, there's a two-sided side to this. God is going to keep you, but do you want the Lord to keep you? If you want the Lord to keep you, he'll keep you. He'll say, he's able, he's able to do it. Do you want him to keep you? If you want him to keep you, he'll keep you. If you want him to, uh, if you want to stay in the faith, he'll keep you in the faith. It's a response to his love, it's a response to his calling all the time. Corey Ten Boom has an interesting story, a fascinating story. She talks about she was so scared one time and she didn't know if she was going to be able to stand in, in the difficult times that she was in. And she remembers a story of her dad and, and she was so scared and, 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 and her dad would tell her um, she, she didn't know she was going to stand uh, in the long term of all the stuff that was happening. And she tells a story her dad uh, will be at the train station and her dad would tell her, like, you know, when you're at the train station, do, do I give you the ticket way ahead of time, or do I give you the ticket right when you need it? And she said, no, Dad, you give it to me right when I need it. It's exactly how the Lord's going to do with us. We may not think we'll be able to stand, because Amen. there's no need to stand that way right now. There's a, there's a need to stand right now, but not in the way that uh, maybe in difficult times will come. At that time, I have no doubt the Lord will give us that strength to stand in the most difficult times. He's able. Yes. And the brother right there. <coughs> he's, he's Stephanie's controlling the room. We're looking like a bit, sir. Okay. Please, Jacob, can you tell us uh, why uh, a Christian uh, who claims to be a believer in Yeshua is supposed to be a Christian, and suddenly uh, he's pro-Palestinian, and uh, rather than being pro-Israel, so I will have to go out why that should be. Okay. That's it. Okay. Like any other error, like any other error, it comes from either misunderstanding or departing from the Word of God. But when people actually depart from the teaching of the Word of God, it's because they're departing from Jesus himself. Okay. Young believers can come under wrong teaching of replacement theology. I've yet to find a credible argument in favor of replacement theology. I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the preeminent so-called evangelical theologians in this country is N.T. Wright, Nigel Wright. He was an Anglican Bishop of Durham. Now you have to understand in the Church of England it's evangelical does not necessarily mean born again. It means not liberal and not Catholic. <laughs> it doesn't mean they're saved necessarily. Okay. So that's where he's coming from. The Anglican definition of evangelicism, which does not necessarily mean second birth theologically to them. 
And he's their preeminent so-called conservative or evangelical theologian in this country. In his book dealing with the relationship between Israel and the church, and he's replacementist, he does not have an exegesis of Romans 9 to 11. How can you address the subject of the church's relationship with Israel and ignore the heart of the New Testament's teaching on that subject, which is Romans 9 to 11. He ignores the central argument. This is Nigel Wright. I find, I'm not saying he's a fraud, but I am saying that he's not the scholar he's made out to be. There are other areas where I would disagree with him. He said because the Pharisees didn't agree with the oral law and the Sadducees, I'm sorry, because the Sadducees didn't accept the oral law, the Torah bar pay, and the Pharisees did, he somehow thinks that that made the Sadducees more conservative. In fact, the Sadducees denied the resurrection, they denied the supernatural, the angelic. They were more liberal. Uh, I don't think he's a very good scholar overall. And he's an Anglican, which in itself is something of an <laughs> indictment. <laughs> but he's their best. When you look at people like Gary Burge in the United States, he selectively ignores Luke 21, 24. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the... He selectively ignores it. He selectively ignores Matthew 23, 39. The Jews must be back in Jerusalem and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He said, selectively ignores Zechariah 12. The Jews of Jerusalem, they'll look upon me who they have pierced. They selectively ignore passages of scripture in both testaments that don't fit their presupposition. The quintessential figure in this country, in the character of what you described, somebody who had once not been replacement theology, but went into it and became pro-Palestinian, is Stephen Sizer. He was not always replacementist. Um, he became pro-Palestinian. Now, Stephen Sizer was not just anti-Zionist. His statements were anti-Semitic, hmm. that Jews were involved and responsible for September 11th, right. that other things. It became so terrible that the Church of England, a liberal bishop, a liberal bishop, not a conservative bishop, a liberal bishop from Reading, banned him from preaching as vicar in his own church. Yikes. When a liberal, unsaved Anglican bishop bans a vicar from preaching in his own church, <laughs> you must be pretty bad. <laughs> Stephen Sizer agreed to debate me on television, and then he chickened out. Uh, again, he knows he can't debate. Something is wrong with these people. At best, at best, it is a young believer who becomes misguided by wrong teaching. Yeah. But with these other people, like Sizer, who you described, there's something wrong with them spiritually. The things they've come out with, Jesus was a Palestinian Christian. <laughs> the Romans did not even call that place Palestine until the second century. A yep. hundred years after the time of Jesus or more. They didn't even call it that. The Romans gave the ancient Philistine name from Latin in the second century after Bar Kokhba's rebellion. There was no such thing as a Palestinian. There was, the term was never even invented yet, except in the Hebrew Philistine from the Old Testament, which had nothing to do with the Palestinian now, yeah. anthropologically or otherwise, or historically or otherwise. This is how absurd it is. Absurd. I once saw a picture drawn by a kid of an Arab hanging on a cross. Jesus, like an Arab with a kafir, saying, they hated me, they will hate you also. 
meaning the Jews. Yeah. This is what is put into these people by distorting the scriptures. Yeah. Now we can go into this, to the hypocrisy of it. The persecution of Christians in the surrounding Arab and Muslim countries is horrific. Israel by far has the best human rights record in the Middle East, the best women's rights record, and certainly the best record of religious freedom for Christians. Yet they're the ones they always want to single out. This is a demonic spirit going back to Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, your seed and her seed. There's a demonic element to this. With people like Sizer, certainly, there's a demonic, and Gary Burge in America. I'm convinced there's a demonic element. Mm -hmm. there, theirs is not just blindness. Theirs is a willful blindness. Right. Theirs is a willful blindness. Now, Christians who are in, in, in churches that are not very good, with bad teaching, you can have a believer in a, in, in, in a Reformed church or an Anglican church who has just never taught the truth. Okay. They may not be as responsible. That's right. They don't. But when you have somebody who, who has the wherewithal to know and then misleads others, now you have a problem. This is the problem with people like Burge and Sizer. Okay? It's a big problem in the U.S. It's, I don't know how big it is here, but I imagine Huge. Huge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of it is motivated by political things. It is 99.9% uh, .9 is political has nothing to do with the scriptures, arguments, uh, like Jacob was talking about Romans 9 through 11. If you just look at uh, the book of Acts, the book of Romans, and the book of Revelation, filled with Israel, filled with Israel. Any, any Christian, any young Christian can just pick up their Bible, look at the promises of God, even in the New Testament for Israel, and will conclude that God's not done with them, and there's a future plan for them, and there is no mention of any Palestinians at all whatsoever. It's, it's strictly political. But like you said, Jacob, there are new believers who don't know, and they're being uh, seduced by these teachers and, and yes. they're motivated politically. Anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, replacement theology, uh, preterism, all these things that have infiltrated the church. They've given people bad lenses to scripture, and yes. they don't really see it. One other aspect, thank you, Marco. One other aspect is this. If you read books like Jeremiah, or the, the pre-captivity prophets, their threat was coming from Babylon. The threat to them nationally was coming from Babylon. Yet they began to imitate and placate the Babylonians. <laughs> the threat to the Western world comes from Islam. Yet they're beginning to placate and imitate Islam. They're doing the same thing that Judah did in the days of Jeremiah. This, you imitate and take the side of your own enemy against you. One expression of this, the most anti-Israel president, the, modern, the most anti-Israel president the United States has ever had was Barack Obama. Yes. He called, he pressured the British government, the New Zealand government to vote against Israel and UNESCO to say that Israel had no right to the Wailing Wall, things like this. He was the most anti-Israel president there's ever been in American history. Yet 78% of American Jews voted for him. You know, these people who volunteer to pay their own train fare to Auschwitz. It just, well, it's, it's a spiritual delusion. You look at it, Trump is the most pro-Israel president the United States has ever had. By far, by far, he's the most, all of his grandchildren are Jewish. Yeah. He's the most pro-Jewish president, okay? The most by far. And he gets attacked. <laughs> and the people trying to kill him, like Schiff and these people, they're Jews. <laughs> and the, the Zucker from CNN, these are Jews. Racial matter, these are Jews. You know, it's like you're voting for the Nazis. <laughs> yeah. It's a delusion. I once heard Bernie Sanders has come against Israel. Yeah. Come against, and and, and then he says he's a Jew, but he's not a practicing Jew. And, uh, but, but then he goes to the synagogues to get the votes and things like that. That's so all just, <laughs> I, I have a question, Jacob. We, we have a problem now in Israel, and I, I want to know how to advise the people on this. Okay. 
we have now more orthodox Jews, not ultra-orthodox with the curls, orthodox Jews who love the word of God uh, and who try their best to, to do what God asked them to do. Um, and they've come to faith. I'm thinking of two men in particular. Um, and they are truly born again now. We've been talking with them for a couple of years. Um, they are rejected by the Messianic fellowships. Actually, the Messianic fellowships think that they're probably infiltrators, <laughs> spies. Um, they haven't even talked to them to see that they're born again. But the interesting thing is that the Orthodox men who are saved, they don't want to be part of the Messianic fellowships because they see the rubbish in there that we have in our churches. Pastors, kids sleeping with their boyfriends and girlfriends, uh, money being wrongly used, the whole kit and caboodle that we have, they're, they're, they're in the Messianic fellowships just the same, we're all the same. And they see this and they're trying to keep godly ways because that's how they've been brought up. And so they don't want to be part of the Messianic Fellowship for that reason, and I don't blame them, because I said, well, yeah, I've come out of the church, you know. They don't, they don't want to be part of the Messianic Fellowships anyway, because of all that rubbish. Um, and now they're saying to us, well, you Gentiles who love Israel, can we have dialogue with you? Because now, listen, this is really interesting. We don't want to be part of the church we want to be part of the family because Jesus came for a family and a bride. And, and I can see their point of view. I don't, I, I don't know how to advise them. First of all, not all the congregations in Israel are bad. Oh, I know they're not. Yossi Ovadi's yeah. congregation in Galilee is good. You know, yeah. Menno Kalitz's congregation is good. They're, they're good, they're moral. They're doctrinally upright, and their basic doctrine is all very They're good. Just speaking about yeah. the areas of Yeah, men. okay. So first of all, there are many, many house fellowships in Israel that are tied to bigger congregations in the city. So it says in Proverbs 18.1, He who remains alone quarrels against all sound wisdom, and they seek their own desire. There may be a thing where they don't want any fellowship with accountability involved. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I can't speak to individuals. I don't know. But I do know what Proverbs 18.1 says. It's inexcusable to be out of fellowship when you have an option. They want fellowship, but they don't know where to go. They anywhere. should go. They, they should, uh, where do they live in Israel? Jerusalem. Then they should go to Menno College's congregation. Yeah. They should go to Menno's congregation. That's what they should do. There's others, but it should go to Menos. Yeah. <coughs> yes. I'm slightly confused, uh, Jacob. You know the rapture? We, we go up for the wedding feast <coughs> with, the, with the Lord. Then we come back down again for the thousand years to rule and teach. And, and then, uh, is it then we get the new earth after that? <coughs> the new earth is at the end of the thousand the years. At the end of the thousand years yeah. and the, the judgment. Yes. Well, the judgment of the, of the unsaved. Of the unsaved. Yes, 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 correct. At the end yeah. of the thousand years. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I wasn't sure. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> At the rupture, would it be a dramatic event, or is it is happening quietly? It'll be a dramatic event for those. <laughs> it will be a dramatic event for those who are raptured. <laughs> they see it. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea of a secret rapture. The rapture is only secret in the sense that we don't know the day or the hour. There is nothing in scripture that says the rapture will be a secret when it happens. That was invented by Darby. Okay? The rapture of Elijah was not a secret. The rapture of Jesus and the ascension was not a secret. The rapture of Enoch was not a secret. What is a secret is the day or the hour. 
Will it be dramatic? For those who are raptured, it certainly will be. We'll meet the Lord in the air. <coughs> it will concur with the resurrection. We'll be reunited with our unsaved lo- with our saved loved ones who are Christians. It'll be very dramatic. Yes. It'll be what no eye hath seen or ear hath heard. It'll be good beyond description once it happens. So for those involved in it, yes. For the others, it'll be dramatic in a bad sense. They'll say, let the rocks fall on us. For the unsaved, it'll be dramatic in a bad sense. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. I'm an ex uh, RAF, spent seven years uh, defending our country in the Cold War. I support Barnabas Fund and I'm absolutely appalled at the slaughter of Christians, uh, Africa, Asia, mainly by Muslims. If I uh, was permitted to have a pistol, I would gladly defend my uh, family. If uh, I was threatened in that way, unfortunately, these poor beggars have got no arms. They, <coughs> it's all the bad guys who've got the AK-47s. Am I wrong in wanting to defend myself as a Christian, or does that go against God's theology? The New Testament does not teach against self-defense. Jesus said, if you knew what day the thief was coming to break into your house, you'd protect it. Yeah. He said, bring two swords. Now, of course, that has a symbolic meaning of the Old and New Testament. But the New Testament, soldiers were not told to stop being soldiers. They were told not to be corrupt ones. Yeah. It is the way the Holy Spirit leads you in the situation. But rank pacifism is not a teaching of the New Testament. No, it is not. As far as what you're saying... I, I too am a supporter of the Barnabas Fund. I support it. That's right. I do it by standing order, but I, I get the, the newsletters online and things yeah. like that. And I know I know Patrick. It's okay though. Yeah, I know. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I too am a supporter of it. Uh, and I think they do good work. Um, you got to understand something. Those poor Christians don't have the means to defend themselves. You're right. But if somebody does defend themselves, like Israel, then the aggressor becomes the victim. (laughs) Then the aggressor becomes the victim. And the media and the left-wing academic establishment makes the victim out to be the aggressor. Israel's outnumbered, it's surrounded, it's got the best human rights record in the Middle East. It's the victim. Right now, look what's happening with the rockets from Gaza. Most of you would know this. They will shoot rockets at Israeli civilian targets. They hit Beersheba. Okay. When the Israelis are forced to fire back in self-defense, the the Muslims (laughs) will fire the rockets next to schools and hospitals. They will store rockets in schools and hospitals. So when the Israelis are forced to fire back in self-defense to protect their own civilians, the collateral damage will kill Palestinian civilians, so-called. That's their strategy. They make themselves out to be the victim. What they're a victim of is their own corruption and the satanic lie of fundamentalist Islam. Unfortunately, I'm also a naturalized Australian. I had rifles in the day before we were disarmed. In your country, it's a very well-armed country. Yeah. In many ways, I wish I was living in America. I have a <laughs> Look, I'm an American. Second Amendment is sort of like bred into us. And uh, absolutely, I agree with Jacob about self-defense and things like that. However, I live in California. Might as well say, you know, Russia or something like that in the, in the 1950s because that what he said about the, the aggressor becomes, you know, the, 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 the victim becomes um, 
when it becomes the aggressor, yeah. And the media will play that thing, and they, I mean, people can't even defend themselves. There's thieves How dare you defend yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Guys get arrested, and they go into prison because they defended themselves because somebody broke into their house, and they, yep. they shot at someone, and all of a sudden, yep. and they get these lawyers, you know, and then and they said, well, he's, he's a racist. He saw, he saw color, and he saw something, and he shot, and, and all of a sudden, you're a racist killer. And he was just trying to defend his house. And, uh, but that's what's becoming. But uh, totally, I, I agree with Jacob. And, and I think the New Testament teaches that for sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Got to hold it very close. Uh, th this question might be cheating because it's asking really for a repeat. It's mainly for Marco. I wonder if you could enlarge a bit and repeat what you were saying about the colored horses in Revelation uh, 6, I think it was, so all I got for clarity is that the black horse, which is famine, got followed by Nero, okay. representing Antichrist. I couldn't follow the connection with Zechariah, and even less so with Laban, which means white. What's that got to do with a white horse? Okay. <laughs> in Revelation 6, you have the colored horses, and you have the white horse, which is, uh, we would agree, this Antichrist, at least I'd see it that yes. way. And, uh, and, and then the other horses are described, black, red, and, uh, and the other color for the, 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 the diseases, pestilence. In Zechariah chapter 6, there's another description of four other horses with the same similar colors, except the one is dappled. The last one is dappled. If we agree that the Antichrist is the white horse and he comes on the scene, the black horse is famine, it's very clear in Zechariah says he goes to the north and the white follows him. And then the dapple goes to the south. Now, we're not told where the red goes in, to, in that description of Zechariah, but the three directions, or three horses are giving two directions. If Revelation gives us the understanding of what those horses are, then famine goes to the north and the Antichrist follows it. And it follows the theme of other passages of scripture where Pharaoh takes advantage of the famine to control everyone. Nero takes advantage yes. of the famine to control everyone. Herod takes advantage of the famine and controls everyone. If the north is the northern hemisphere, I guess you would see it between the north and the south, the, the, this sort of fighting that's going on in the world today, developed countries and not developed, and third world countries, you see this, this, this fighting right now, especially in America. We see the, the southern borders are being completely uh, inundated and uh, attacked in many ways. Well, same thing happens in Europe, same thing has happened in other countries. You see this tension. Daniel talks about this north and the south conflict, yes. especially it's going to be in Israel when you have the north and the south coming in, especially at the times of the prophets, it was Egypt and Syria, and Israel was always caught in the middle. Yes. Be the same thing. I, my understanding of it, based on Zechariah in Revelation, is the Antichrist, the white horse, will take advantage of famines. And it could be, and this is, this is again, my opinion at this point, he'll take advantage of it and somehow institute some kind of system in which he will regulate who can buy, sell, trade. It may be the beginning of the mark of the beast yes, at that's that right. point. That's right. A crisis will come to the north. If it is the developed world, we need to be aware of that. As myself and us here, we live in the developed world, and uh, we, we we're told in the Bible difficult times will come. Revelation talks about it. I see no um, nothing that precludes a tragedy or some kind of war that will spark all this. Um, I mean, we're in the cusp of a war, and many times, and you know, we're praying, seeking the Lord what to do. Um, we shouldn't be unaware of these things that are happening, wars, rumors of wars, and things like that. Um, Laban, his name means white, and it's a typology, it's an illustration of it in, in the book of Genesis. He makes a deal with Jacob, Israel, and he breaks the deal, seven-year covenant, yep. seven-year treaty, and Correct. he breaks it, and he gives him the other wife, you know, Leah. But it, it's showing you something about white, treachery, Israel, covenant, seven years. I think it's there for a reason. It teaches what, what's coming. You could see, obviously, these are illustrations and points, but Daniel talks about it. Second Thessalonians talks about it. Revelation talks about it. So it's not just we're getting it from typology. There are specific doctrines that speak directly, and all these things are just illustrating it or highlighting it, how it would play out. Just like Laban made this deal with Israel, Jacob, you yeah. can see the Antichrist coming in and making that shrewd deal with Israel. Yes. Um, very briefly, Mark, just not to add what he said, yeah. but 
the white horse that is the Antichrist in Revelation 6 is the satanic counterfeit of Jesus coming on the white horse in Revelation 19, okay? He, he, the Antichrist comes before Christ and tries to counterfeit him. That's the idea of the white horse. That's right. Okay. Anything Antichrist does, it's a mimic of Christ. That's right. The white horse, he has some kind of pseudo-resurrection right. thing that's going to happen with the wound in the head. Uh, everything he does, he's got an anti, you know, the, the, there's a mystery of lawlessness, but there's a mystery of godliness. That's too. right. So there's always a, a counterfeit to what the Lord does. I know this lady. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, if you could please answer, can you explain the term Midrash and uh, uh, why Gentile believers should use it to interpret the scriptures? Jacob, that's all you Okay. <laughs> and also, can I ask a second question? <laughs> Excuse me. Dr. Varish. I can't hear what you say. Oh, okay. Can so I hear you? The, what is Midrash and uh, uh, why Gentile believers should uh, use it to interpret the scriptures? And also, why Jewish, many Jewish Messianic believers cannot uh, see in scriptures that Jesus is God when he allowed uh, people to worship him uh, on many occasions and also could forgive sins? Okay, I'll take your first question first and your second question second. <laughs> Midrash is a compound word. Me means from. Drash means inquiring into. The Hebrew word for a preacher usually is adrashan, adrashan. Midrash, one who inquires into. The word drash is found dozens and dozens and dozens of times in the Old Testament. Mi is simply from the drash. The actual term midrash itself as a compound term is also found in the Old Testament, but it's usually mistranslated into English as treaties, such as the, mid, the treaties of Edo, the treaties of Edo and kings that, well, the, the term in Hebrew is Midrash. In the New Testament, where you see Jesus says, in John, you search the scriptures, you're inquiring into, <laughs> okay. Now, these methods of hermeneutics, why should Gentile Christians, no, why should any Christian use them? Because the apostles did. It is the way the New Testament interprets the Old. Okay? There have always been, the, the early Christians knew this, there have always been people who understood this. Going back to the time of the Puritans in the 17th century here in England, I have the whole series of commentaries, Midrasha commentary on the New Testament written by the Puritan theologian John Lightfoot. He, he knew about it. If you were to look at academic, evangelical academics today, T.S. Doherty or E.E. E. Ellis or any of these people. Longernecker. Rick R. R. Longernecker. Yeah, they'd all tell you the New Testament authors used Midrash. Um, some crackpot said Jacob Prash invented it. <laughs> You're pretty famous, Jacob. <laughs> and, and I got it from a cult leader named Stuart Trail. I was one of the first people to denounce Stuart Trail, and he wouldn't have known what Midrash was. Uh, just, they just lie and say, speak rubbish. But it, 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 it's in the scripture. We should do it because it's in the scripture. You can see people doing somersaults, acrobatics, trying to explain the way the New Testament handles the Old. How can you say, out of Egypt I called my son? By grammatical and historical exegesis from Hosea 11.1, 1, that's talking about the Exodus. How can you say it's about Jesus? Well, yes, by Western 16th century humanist grammatical historical exegesis, which is not wrong. It's right in what it says, it's wrong in what it overlooks. <laughs> uh, but you can't explain Matthew's use of it, saying it's about Jesus coming out of Egypt when Herod died. Yeah. But midrashically you can. Pressure and pressure interpretations. Uh, 
why the New Testament will speak of fallen as Babylon in the book of Revelation when Babylon fell to the Persians as predicted by Isaiah. It takes one historical event from the past and says it's, says it's really fulfilled prophetically. It's the way the apostles handled the scriptures. It's the way Jesus taught the scriptures. In the dark ages, the Roman Catholic Church went away from the scriptures. Their hermeneutics were based on Gnosticism. They spiritualized texts out of context. When the Reformation happened, the reformers went back to the literal meaning in order to undo the mysticism of Roman Catholicism. Okay. They were right in what they did. They were wrong in what they failed to do. There is nothing wrong with grammatical historical exegesis. It is right in what it affirms. It is inadequate in what it overlooks. You cannot explain ballistics or rocket science with arithmetic. If you're going to explain ballistics and rocket science and the relationship between velocity and trajectory and things like this and resistance, you have to use calculus. <laughs> you have to use calculus. You can't just use arithmetic. Arithmetic is right. It's not wrong, but it's inadequate. Okay. Grammatical historical exegesis, you can read the epistles with it. When the epistles use Midrash, it explains it. Like the two women in, in Galatians, Sarah and Hagar. It explains what it is. The only exception would be Jude that was written to Jewish believers who would have understood it anyway. But you can use grammatical historical exegesis. As it were, you can use arithmetic to read Romans. <laughs> okay. But you cannot use grammatical historical exegesis alone to understand Revelation or Zechariah or Daniel or the way the New Testament handles the old, you need the calculus. It's right in what it says. It's inadequate in what it overlooks. We should do it because the scriptures do it. Okay. Second question. Second question, okay. It's not a lot of people. It's a minority of people. There was a large group of Jews in the early centuries of Christianity called Ebionites who believed that Jesus was a unique man. They even believed he was the Messiah but denied his divinity. You have Neo-Ebionites today in Israel and a few elsewhere. They are people usually saved out of, or, or, people who are Orthodox Jews, I wouldn't say they were saved, they're Orthodox Jews who become convinced he's the Messiah based on the prophecies but cannot come to terms with his deity because of their background in Talmudic Judaism and because of the social castigation that would result in saying he's God That's right. within the Orthodox community. There are Ebionites today. They don't call them that but that's what they are theologically the Neo-Ebionites. But most Jewish believers are not that. They're a small number. A really small, even in Israel, there's only a small number of them. I doubt that they make up any more than 2% or something. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, one problem you do have, though, in this regard, is that why, while there may only be two fellowships that teach it, there are other fellowships who are overextending, saying as long as you believe Jesus is the Messiah, we'll accept you as a brother. Mm. So we don't agree with your Ebionism, but we still accept you as a communicant, as a brother, and just because you believe he's the Messiah. Well, Satan believes he's the Messiah. So there is a problem with fellowships who don't teach you to believe it themselves, 
but are willing to accept as believers those who are Rabbinites. If somebody denies the deity of Christ, yeah. we have to very seriously doubt their salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Jim, in the back there. Up. Have a seat. Okay, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Jim. I'll be quick. Uh, okay. Regarding the mark of the base. Sorry? Regarding the mark yes. of the base. Can you shed light on how we can conduct ourselves in a practical way? Concerning the mark of yeah, well, okay. The first thing is, when First John speaks of Antichrist, he prefaces his remarks concerning the Antichrist who's coming in First John by saying, love not the world. <laughs> People who love the world and I don't just mean love worldliness, but they love their lives in this world. Their trust is in this life and in this world. They are going to be the people who are going to be most inclined to accept the mark of the beast. Christians, professing Christians who love their life in this world, or ones particularly who love the world, they are going to be the ones most likely to accept the mark of the beast. It is not adequate to say, don't take the mark. Yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> but the key is to love not the world. Those who love the world, whose trust is in this life and in this world, are much more likely to cave in. I've also said many times, and I'll perhaps say it one more time, today, many will fall away and betray one another. That's happening now. But the people who follow false teachings, who defend false teachings, particularly the word of faith, name it and claim it stuff, those people will easily, easily betray other Christians because they've been taught the lie, they don't have to suffer, they're a king's kid, yeah. name it and claim it, blab it and grab it and when difficult times come their faith is going to fail them because they were taught faith in faith instead of faith in Christ what you see happening with the word faith preachers it is not just mammon worship masquerading as Christianity it is not just faith in faith masquerading as faith in Christ. There's something much more sinister. It's setting people up for Antichrist. Okay? That's what's happening. Does that answer the question? Okay. Does the statement, every eye shall see him, refer to Jesus coming for his saints or with his saints? Okay, that's a very good question. <laughs> Yeah, you are correct in saying that there's a rapture when he comes for the faithful church and then he comes with it. Yeah. Okay? To the best of my understanding, it means both. <laughs> yeah. The rapture will not be a secret. They're going to say, hide us from this one who's coming. Okay. The rapture will be a secret again in that we don't know the day or the hour. But when it happens, it's not going to be a secret as to what happened. But when he comes back with the saints, that's also not going to be a secret. It's going to be a visible event. <laughs> to the best of my understanding, it is both. Okay? Every eye shall see him. And every knee will bow. Yes. Revelation chapter 1. It also has to include the Jewish people has to see him. Yeah, yeah. If you look at Revelation 1.7. Yeah. It fulfills Zechariah 12. Even those who pierced them. Even those who pierced them. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a special revelation to the yeah. remnant in Zechariah chapter 12. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, going back to the question on Midrash. Yes. Uh, can you, one, for those of us who don't, aren't familiar with the term, there are younger people here. 
well, myself as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> clarify the term, briefly, or as long as you like, as far as I'm concerned, and elaborate on it in terms of the, it being uh, able to interpret scripture. So, for example, there's this, I'm brought up, uh, I believe, obviously, believe in the whole Bible. So, the, uh, there's this thing about one, one, one testament uh, interprets in the other, and the, clip, and the one I give as an example is the understanding of Abraham. In the New Testament, it says, Abraham believed God could raise the dead. You know, that explains why Abraham was doing what he was doing. So, my point is this, all scripture, we know, we know this, all scripture is God breathed, yeah? So, in Timothy, when, it, when that is saying that the scriptures they have then was the, old, was the Old Testament. So, the Bible, you know, we shouldn't even divide into old and new. Let's just say that. My point, my, my question is this. Elaborate on, well, please elaborate on that the Midrash can be used to interpret scripture in that you're, you're almost, I know, know you're not doing that, but you're almost equivocating the authority of Midrash to be in scripture. Do you, do you get what I'm asking you? No. no. <laughs> if, if you are using Midrash to interpret scripture, it's like, it, it's like saying that Midrash in itself is like scripture. Now, Midrash is a hermeneutic, a methodology of interpreting scripture. Right. There was also later, rabbi I, there was also later rabbinic writings called Midrash that have nothing to do with yeah. Midrash as a hermeneutic. Yeah, so what I'm saying is if you, read the, if you read the whole Bible and you're using the text, you know, you're using the, what you say, you know, text, context, code text, and using the Bible, and then you bring Midrash into it, okay. as in rabbinical writings, no, 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 that's later. That came later. Yeah. The rabbinical writings are centuries later. So what I'm saying is, in a minute, just uh, clarify what Midrash is. And I've, I've got another question. This isn't my question, but this is for another lady I'll ask in a minute. Okay. Do you now understand what I'm asking you? Okay. <laughs> the authority of scripture. Okay. You have Midrash. Okay, Midrash simply means from inquiring into what you take out of the scripture by inquiring into it. That's all it means. It was a method of hermeneutics. Later, the rabbis anonymously wrote these things centuries later that they called Midrash. In other words, it's like this. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four gospels written by apostles under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Centuries later, Gnostics wrote things like the Gospel of Thomas in the 5th century. Just because they call it a Gospel, that does not invalidate Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because Gnostics came along hundreds of years later and wrote stuff they call Gospel. Well, Midrash is not invalidated by the fact that anonymous rabbis came along hundreds of years later and called what they wrote Midrash. Okay? Understand that bit? Secondly, there's two kinds of Midrash, Halakhic and Haggadic. Halakhic is legalistic. It's very rabbinic. It's about legalism and legalistic interpretations. We're not interested in that. We are only interested in Haggadic. The Passover ritual is called the Haggadah, the Haggadah. The Passover is a type of the death of the Lamb of God. It's Haggadic. I'll give you another example. The Midrash that St. Paul was taught from the school of Hillel, he was a Pharisee, were based on something called the Midot. The Midot. The first of the Midot, like points, is called Kalvahomer, light to heavy. If something is true in a light situation, it becomes very true in a heavy situation. So I'll read Hebrews 10.25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, <clears throat> as is the habit of some. Fellowship is always important. That's the call. That's the light. But encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day drawing near. 
the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the more important, the heavier it becomes. It's always true, but it becomes emphatically true in a heavy situation. Light to heavy, okay? That, that is an example of Madrid. The author of Hebrews is, is using Karl Rahama. Another is Binyan Ab Mishte Ketubim, building an argument for, from two or more texts. How do we link Fallen as Babylon in Revelation 17 with what Isaiah was talking about? You're interpreting one in light of the other, okay? You're making an argument from two texts talking about the same thing. There may even be situations where on the surface the text can seem to be talking about different things, but using binyan ab mishtei ketuvim, they're talking about the same thing. I'll give you an example. Okay. In Zechariah, the vultures came and carried the, the wicked woman in the basket. Okay. Yeah, chapter 5. When you get to Revelation, every unclean bird, vultures were, un they were not kosher birds, Jews couldn't eat them, they were unclean birds, figures of the demonic, they were demonically carried. The parable of the sower and the seed, the birds ate them. It's a picture of, of demonic attack. How do you arrive at that? You interpret one scripture in light of another when it is using the same language and the same description. Even though the text may not on the surface appear to be talking about the same thing, it is. That is another example, but there's much more to it than I'm telling you. It's there, it's in scripture, it's a method of interpreting the scripture that was used by Jesus and the apostles. The church largely lost it, although there have been people in the history of the church who saw it. In the last days, when the natural branches are grafted in again, the faithful church becomes more aware of its Jewish origins. As this happens, they begin to read the scriptures as a Jewish book. And they begin to understand the scriptures the way the early Christians did. Does that make sense? The Midrash is a hermeneutic. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's why I wanted it clarified. Not to be but confused with this later stuff the rabbis invented. It's not a text. And a well, there are texts called Midrash, but that was written hundreds of years later yeah. by these anonymous rabbis that was all legalistic gibberish, mostly. Okay, thank you. In the time of Jesus, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which we've largely lost in the West. Not completely, but largely. Yeah. Um, this isn't my question, but I'll ask it. Uh, this is something else now. Will you... Oh, no, this is will you ask. Right, the question is... <laughs> what is the mark of the beast, please? Wow. <laughs> the mark of the beast, essentially, spiritually, is the opposite of the mark of the lamb. It begins in Ezekiel, when the angel was sent into the city to mark with the tav, the, tav. the cross, yeah. on the heads of those who are faithful to God. Those who are faithful to God have the mark of the lamb. Yes. The others have the mark of the beast. It is the theological and spiritual opposite of the mark of the lamb. Practically, what it appears is going to happen. Already now, with three months ago, there's a company in Wisconsin in America that is paying its employees $300 to get a subcutaneous microchip on their right hand between the thumb and pointing finger right here. Yeah. Uh, and they're swiping. Yeah, there's there's British people here that I mean, I'm not here, but that uh, work through a company called Biohacks, which is out of Sweden. I think there's over 250 Brits that already have have been yeah, and uh, they get paid like that. They work like that, and uh, they, they sort of have a badge of honor because they call themselves uh, sort of androids. 
because they, they go and personally get this done in sort of robotic with the human-like type figure. And it's already in the States, not as much as Sweden in, in, in Great Britain and Germany, which seem to be the most adopted yeah. ones. Go ahead, there was a professor in Reading University 10 years ago who implanted biointeractive microchips that would organically interact. And he, could, he claimed he, he could, to a degree, control emotion with technology. Um, now, people have been able to do that with things like electroshock and so forth and sodium pentothal, but I'm talking about an, impl an implantation of the technology yeah. where you're going to have people who are hybrids of being human and robotic. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this stuff points to the image of the beast no very clearly where you have organic microchips and where you have a hybrid of being human and being robotic, this definitely points to the image of the beast in Revelation. I'm not saying it's it, I'm simply saying these things can be technologically facilitated. It goes beyond this. I touched on this yesterday. With the Enlightenment, we had a schism between science and the occult. It was alchemy. Chemistry and physics went one way, magic the other. Healing arts went one way, medicine and pharmacology went the other. Astro astronomy went one way, astrology went the other. There is a reprochement. People will begin trying to clone DNA to facilitate reincarnation to somehow convince themselves that immortality is humanly achievable by cloning their own DNA. By bringing themselves back, they will attempt to, with biotechnic means, facilitate reincarnation. This stuff is no longer science fiction. It's no longer like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. We are speaking about reality. Yeah. Jacob, can I interject real quick? There is a church in Florida that actually worships technology through immortality. Yep. Uh, it, it is, you can go there and you can get a lot of things done, hip surgeries and all kinds of things uh, that it's paid through the church. You have to pay into it, of course. And, uh, but the point is they want to make you immortal through technology. That's they, right. They literally worship technology yep. and immortality. The Scientology cult was to some degree based on this kind of thinking. Yeah, science. Where they do emotional audits and things like that. That, that was probably the first step towards it. It was the Scientology cult. It's moving in that direction. Yeah, Mark of the Beast, is, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject. I don't think anybody really knows at this point what it is. There's a revelation more to come. But I think Jacob's it's absolutely right on to the things that he's talking about. But the Bible does speak of these things in a, in a very clear way in terms of spiritual. Uh, you have the mark of the Lord upon his people. You got the mark of the beast on uh, uh, the unbelievers. And you got, remember, uh, to Sardis, it says the Lord is going to give them the, the, um, the name of the city of my God, the name of my God, uh, the city of Jerusalem, my God, in my new name. It says there's a mark on people that are the Lord. Yeah, I will throw out two yeah. terms very briefly, then we'll end this question. Isopsophy and gematria, mm. alphanumeric values of letters in Hebrew and in Greek. Somehow it is going to be the number of a man's name, yeah. either by isopsophy or by gematria or by both. Yeah. Now they calculated nearer to be six. Yeah, it was the first one they did it with. Yeah. It's going to be really, really interesting. And, and you got this thing called, uh, you know, the cryptography. Yep. And you got things like blockchain coming in and hyperledger that uh, are absolutely going to change, really, the economic systems of the world and the way we do transactions and the way we do things. It's a digital economy that's coming, and a lot of people don't know what is coming down the line, but it's going to change literally the way you bank, the way you buy, the way you do anything. It's going to be... Uh, not the traditional way, and it's, and I'm not saying that's the mark of the beast by any means. What I'm saying is we're changing economies very quickly 
and it's going to change very rapidly to yeah. all of us. Remember, anything fallen man can use for evil, he will. Yeah. The world is in the power of the wicked one. Yeah. We have radioactive isotopes that can fight cancer. That's right. But we can use <laughs> radioactive weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. Anything fallen man can use for good, he will use for evil. Right. The world is in the power of the wicked one. Watch the following. Laser holography. That's going to be a big one. Virtual technology. People will create their own subjective reality. They'll go into a simulator. And that, they'll think the Cinderella or Napoleon. You can go I always wanted to be Elvis. You can go out of David. <laughs> You can you laugh, laugh at it. Marilyn Monroe. You laugh at it. It's going to happen. Yeah. People go have dates with Marilyn Monroe in a virtual world. That stuff is going to get cheaper. The transition is going to get better. They do. It's, it's already now, done. when people, when you have a technology, it's already being, the way, is, the way is being paved through popular culture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's how it's going to be adopted. The Antichrist and false prophet, for instance, are going to use cosmic signs to deceive people. In counterfeit of the return of Christ, then they will see the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in the heavens. There's going to be a satanic counterfeit of that. It goes back to the 1950s. The things like Superman or pop culture, Iggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars or movies like E.T. To us, this is just popular culture. But you understand with the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. They take on a new... Sci science, science fiction becomes science. You can go back and read writers like Jules Verne. When he wrote those books, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, it was all science fiction. Now it's just science. There's nothing fictitious about it. Well, this is what's happening. The other thing, mark my words, Kids getting addicted to video games. It, through the, the technocracy creates a synthetic reality. They create a synthetic reality where they develop a, a, a worldview that is not the real one. Once you have people detached from reality. You can make them believe anything. Look at what's happening now. There is no such thing as someone who is transgender chromosomally. It is impossible. There is no such thing as a transgender person. What they do? They just look at this. It takes the masculine, yep. even though it's a feminine word. It's a feminine word with that. In, in Spanish, you have it. In Latin, you have it. In Greek and Hebrew, you sometimes have. Gender is not about sex. It is about the way a word is used in the context of a sentence. Okay? Peter is, Petros is masculine. But Jesus is called by the feminine, Petra, in 1 Corinthians. Gender does not mean genetic sex in linguistics, okay? What they have done is taken the linguistic definition of gender and replaced the biological one with it. You understand? They have replaced the biological, the genetic definition of sex, of gender, with the linguistic one. Popular culture has done that. It becomes the law that you must refer to somebody in Canada by their personal pronoun <laughs> of choice. Forget about what they really are. Chromosomal. There's only you got X and you got Y. That's about it. <laughs> Forget about the reality. They 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 substitute, replace the genetic definition with the linguistic one. Once people become detached from reality, they can no longer think objectively and rationally. 
Oh, I can take the mark of the beast. That's just that other world. This is my real world yeah. in my simulator. <laughs> I've been saying for years, the simulators are... I once, I had a, I got a friend, a Jewish believer, he teaches people to write softwares for flight simulators. I went in one of those flight simulators once. <laughs> well, the, the, I wanna, <laughs> it was programmed for me with manual flight rules to land the 747 at Schiphol Airport in Holland. <laughs> I took out six windmills. <laughs> It was one of the worst disasters in aviation history. <laughs> Except it didn't really happen. But you wouldn't know it in the simulator. Yeah. That was years ago. Yeah. The algorithms are much more advanced now. The, graphics. the technology and the definition is much more advanced now. Yeah. That stuff was invented to train astronauts, then fighter pilots, then commercial pilots. Now they're toys. Now that uh, the use of crystal screens and these things is beyond everything. La <laughs> lasers and everything. It, there's no end to it. It looks so real. You would think you were actually flying the plane. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> that technology is going to get so good, it's going to be a pair of glasses. Yeah. Yeah. You will see reality through the lenses of your cyber world of choice. I'm the Pokemon. I'm Elvis. I'm Cinderella. You have a right to call yourself male or female, irrespective of what you really are. Mark my words. A time will come when by law, they will have to call you Cinderella or Napoleon. Yeah. Yeah. There's no stopping it. But it's all going to Revelation 13. Yeah. The mark, the image, the yeah. man, and the false prophet. Religion. It won't seem so far-fetched at the time, you understand? Yeah. It won't seem something so far-fetched or unusual. Thank you. Uh, Revelation 18, I've heard it taught that 9-11 in Revelation... No, that's, uh, that's not... There's nothing at all to do no. in Revelation 18-10. No, that's, that's not, 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 that's not a prophecy, it's September 11th, no. It hasn't happened happen yet. So 9 11 has got nothing to do with No, no absolutely nothing. nothing. Not at all. Yeah. I've got a question, but it's not on Revelation or what you've been speaking about. Is that all right? The, what's the question? Depends. Galatians 5 22, where it speaks about the fruit. I've right. Been, I've been having a little bit of trouble with it because. In our English language, fruit can mean singular or plural. Okay. Um, oh, good. In okay. In Greek, it is singular, and the fruit is the first one, love. Yeah. That's the right. fruit of the Spirit is love. The others derive from love. You understand? It corresponds to 1 Corinthians 13. What well, love is, love is patient, love is kind. Okay. Those descriptions of love in 1 Corinthians 13 correspond to the fruit, fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit itself is love. All of the other ones. First comes love or charity. Joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, mildness. Those are derivative of the love of the Lord. When you have the love of the Lord, those other fruits will be attributes of it. We have to interpret the fruit of the Spirit in light of 1 Corinthians 13. Okay? The other thing we have to interpret the fruit of the Spirit in light of the Holy is the Holy Spirit. In Genesis and in Revelation, the rainbow. Now again, the, the, the homosexuals are taking the rainbow over. The New Ages. The New Ages, yeah, okay. <laughs> It means the sevenfold spirits of God from the book of Isaiah. 
and the Septuagint, particularly, it's the clearest. The sevenfold spirit of God. Remember that God said with Noah, I'm going to give my bow, a rainbow, a keshet. That will be my pledge. I'm not going to do this again. Well, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is called our pledge, our earnest. It's the proof we were saved. Okay? And it corresponds to the rainbow. The white end of the rainbow, of the spectrum, because all the rainbow is is an atmospheric refraction that's a spectrum. Okay? White reflects all the colors. It doesn't absorb any of them. Black <laughs> absorbs all of them. Outermost darkness, when men will weep and gnash their teeth. The reason you see, we're talking about this with Marco, you see so much white in the book of Revelation. The fullness of God's nature. All the colors of the spectrum. The sevenfold spirits of God will all be simultaneously reflected. None of them will be absorbed. It's just like spectrography in, in physics or, or, or biophysics. It's the same, same thing. Forensic scientists use it all the time. Well, the scriptures use it. Okay? So you've got the colors of the rainbow. These have some kind of a correspondence to the attributes of love, which is the fruit of the spirit. Does that make sense? Okay. LGBT have only got six colors. In only, yeah, what does that tell you? <laughs> <laughs> They've got six instead of seven. <laughs> Antichrist. That's right. That's a very interesting. Suits them. Thank you, sir. Jacob, in the area I come from, um, there's a big influence from the Cornhill training course, which comes out of the Proclamation Trust. Don't know, not familiar. Okay, um, but they're all over the country, but they're pretty good in, in training young people um, to be pastors, teachers, etc. But eschatologically, uh, they're very much replacement theology. So I don't know if you, how much you know about it, but I just feel it's a big, a big challenge. Okay. Israel, I've said this before, but I'm answering the question. Most of you have heard this. Israel is a litmus test. Being right about the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews does not automatically prove somebody is kosher in their other theology or upright spiritually. There are plenty of kooks who recognize God has a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews. There's the extreme access of the Messianic movement who lifts up Jewishness instead of Jesusness. They're under the law like the Seventh-day Adventists trying to live with the two covenants. You've got organizations that in effect do covenant theology. People like that John Hagee from America, International Christian Embassy being another that won't evangelize Jews. Bridges for peace, it's another. No Christ, no peace. They don't want him, they just want the bridge without the bridge builder. You know? uh, because somebody understands, or a church, or a ministry, or an organization, understands God has a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews, does not prove they are kosher. It may be an indication of it, but it doesn't prove it. However, if they are replacement theology, and they do not believe God has a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews, it does prove there's something wrong with them. They are misreading scripture. I have never known a theologian, a scholar, an author, a preacher, I've never known even one who was wrong about Israel, who was not also wrong in their other theology somewhere, and seriously so. Because they're fundamentally misreading the Bible. You're fundamentally misreading scripture. If they're wrong about Israel, I guarantee you they're going to be wrong about something else fundamental somewhere. Yeah. I think one of the things with replacement theology that people forget, and I think it's the big one, it's like the elephant in the room, is you're saying God changes his approach and promise to his people. Yeah. And that is a fundamental misreading of who God is. God does not do that. And so when you're saying, well, God's done with the Jews, forget that, I'm going to go to this people, then you're saying God's nature is not the same. And that, that's, we need to know who God is. We need to know the real God and the true God who does not change 
in that respect toward his people. He does not change toward us. It's because you're saying if he changes toward the Jews, then you can change over toward us easily. What guarantee do you have? <laughs> what guarantee do I have? If God is, I'm done with you. And by far, the church has gone into so much sin and so much error that if that was true, he should give us up. Yep. You know? But he doesn't. He's faithful to them, to us, one body, Messiah. If he doesn't have to keep his promises to Israel, why should he keep his yeah. promises to the church? Oh, absolutely. It's yours. Yeah. It's 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 really absolutely. See, but they're also cursing themselves yeah. because grafted into a tree, they say is dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got someone in the back there? Yes, please. Um, it's just picking up on what you um, mentioned, Mark, about truth and error. And uh, Matthew 13 in our church a few months ago, a pastor was teaching Matthew 13 about the mustard seed and about the leaven. And the summary is basically that, you know, um, the Lord's kingdom is going to grow, the church is going to grow. But I've always, always understood that leaven is a symbol for sin. Um, and so I was sitting there on a Sunday morning thinking, this isn't right. Um, and you've just mentioned about replacement theology. There's no sort of acknowledgement of Israel, that God has a plan or purpose for Israel. But you also mentioned about fellowship, that we must fellowship. So I'm a bit in a quandary about the church that I'm in. It's a Grace Baptist church. And, yeah. Okay, first of all, Grace Baptists are very Calvinistic. A God of love does not create people to go to hell. Amen. I told you, if they're wrong about Israel, they're wrong about something else fundamental. Grace Baptists are very Reformed, very Calvinistic. So their premise is, is wrong. God does not create people to go to hell. That is not the biblical meaning of election. Let's look at one verse very briefly in the book of Ezekiel. Turn with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter... 18. Ezekiel 18 verse 28. I do not have pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord. Rather that they should turn, in other words repent, from his ways and live. God does not create people to go to hell. Jesus was clear. Hell was a place made for Satan and his angels. It was not made for people. Okay? First, back, uh, First Timothy, please. First Timothy chapter 2. Verse 4, God who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The first problem with Grace Baptist is it doesn't understand grace. They don't believe Jesus died for everybody, only the elect. They were sometimes known as strict and particular Baptists. I once knew a young woman who asked me, I met her, I was, street pre I was preaching in the Hyde Park Corner, Speaker's Corner in London, and she said to me, brother, are you strict in particular? <laughs> I said, yes. I strictly dislike Calvinism in particular. <laughs> That's the first problem. Second problem. We interpret the parables in light of each other. You handled the scripture correctly. You know what the leaven meant. You understood apparently what the birds meant. He took it in isolation. You interpreted text, 
context, co-text. He did not. I can't tell you what to do, I'm the Holy Spirit, but you seem to understand the scriptures better than your pastor does. <laughs> of course, given the fact that he's a Calvinist, that's not saying much. <laughs> I don't say that to be insulting. I say it to be rude. <laughs> don't tell me that a God of love created people with the full intention of torturing them forever. Or that he became a man and went to the cross and paid for people's sins, including mine, so nobody would go there. Don't tell me that a Jesus who said, it was made for Satan and his angels wants people to go there when he hung on the cross so people wouldn't have to. The whole thing is a battle of garbage. I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not saying that they don't love the Lord. I'm not saying they're not sincere. But what I am saying is their doctrine is fundamentally wrong in several areas. Several fundamental areas. Marco? The parables, we did the study on this quite a long time ago, and, and you, you get it right. The birds, you see the birds in different parts of scripture. And, you know, with Abraham, you see the birds in Revelation, you see the birds. When it's talking about birds in, in a general sense like that, it, it is strictly demonic. It is strictly something that's coming. The birds of the air come and take the seed. When Jesus talks about individual birds, like a sparrow, it, it means a good thing, it's a natural thing. And then he says, how much more? Will God not take care of you? And then the leaven, of course. But you read all the uh, you read all the context of the uh, of the passage here and all the other parables. Uh, Jesus was talking about this parable, and then how are you going to interpret the other parables? It's the key to understand all the parables. If you get that one, you get all the other parables. Um, th there's a there's a big problem with Reformed theology in so many different ways. I'm not a Calvinist. I've, I've never been one. I don't necessarily uh, have a bone to pick with them in a sense of that I once was and now I'm not, but it is to say that I just cannot find it in scripture. I wish they would tell me where it is. Grace in my Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, it simply means kindness, the kindness, generous gift of God. It is nowhere in the Bible described as an, as an irresistible force. I have never been able That's to have right. a reformed pastor, Calvinist theologian, not that they would talk to me personally, but ever describe where grace is described as a force, That's right. as an irresistible force. All my Bible says, it is the kindness of God. It is the grace and mercy, undeserved favor right. of God as a gift. Charis in the New Testament, Hesed in the Old Testament. It is God's faithfulness and kindness toward us that we don't deserve it. And, and the Bible actually says, it has appeared to all men. It has appeared to all men. Not just some people, it has appeared to all men. If all have sinned, then all can be saved. That's what the Bible says. Yep. I don't have to have a theological degree on it. I just simply need to know my Bible. And I encourage you to do that, to know your yep. Bible and to look at those things in, in the fullness of Scripture, the whole context of Scripture, who he is, the whole character of God. Unfortunately, in Reformed theology, they deny a lot of things in the Old Testament. They don't understand prophecy in many circles. They don't really see it as a point, and they don't see the fulfillment of it in, 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 the, in the light of Israel, and they don't also understand grace. Grace, which is, the, can you imagine? Grace is the most beautiful thing God has given us. I mean, yeah. nobody here deserves it. Nobody. It's the, just the mercy of Jesus, his love for us, and yet they turn it into this you, not you, you, not you, you, not you. And it's a lottery. And yep. it's very much, uh, you know, uh, Islam has a similar thing yep. like that. You know, it's uh, Allah, Inja, Allah. Yep. It basically turns Allah into just basically, you want a lottery ticket. It's all the will of God. And if you got it, you got it, man. If yep. you don't, you don't. And it doesn't, yep. doesn't matter what you ever do. You are yep. destined away from Christ yep. in hell. And uh, that's right. That's not the gospel. Otherwise, Jesus would not have sent us to the nations. He wouldn't have sent us to all people. So anyway, we can go on and on, belly aching about yeah. it, but it's a problem that it is in so many churches in America. 
Uh, and then we have this neo-Calvinism that has sort of grown and it's sort of popular and cool and you get tattoos and you get a beard and, and you're a neo-Calvinist and you want to look like Spurgeon and you want to... Uh, if I want to look like Spurgeon, I light up a cigar and smoke them. Uh, uh, one last thing. Yeah. I agree with everything Marco said, but your church does not understand faith either. Yeah. That's the other faith thing. was saved by grace through faith. They believe God spontaneously regenerates somebody. God makes them born again, then they get faith. You understand? They don't understand grace, that's true. They don't understand Israel, that's true. But they don't understand faith either. Faith. And they don't get it about the birds. I'm going to go to a Calvinistic church to sing that. Don't you know about the bird? Everybody knows the bird. It's for the birds. <laughs> but that, that is an important parable. That is, that is, that is an important parable to teach. Um, but we're not saying that they're not good believers. What we're saying is that there are fundamental errors, which eventually, and this is Jacob, if you can allow me this. Second Thessalonians 2. At some point in history, over the next whatever years we have, Second Thessalonians 2, 3, they're going to have a huge problem with that. When the fallen away comes first, yeah, yeah. and then pre tribulation is going to have another big yep. problem, and the man of sin is revealed. In due time, those two theological yeah. schools are going to have to answer the word of God in a very real way. Can apostasy happen? Well, we believe it can. It is happening. But it's going to be absolutely clear when the man of sin is revealed. Then pre-tribulationists have to answer the question, why is he here? And why are Christians still here? If they deny that, there's a bigger problem than just the word of God. They just have a, have a theological framework that they like more than, more than the Bible. Yeah. the goats, The goats? Well, the ducks. <laughs> Is there any more questions? Or? Another question, one more to all of you. Hi, um, Marco. Uh, Marco uh, just, um, I agree, you know I agree with everything you said. And um, I've used all those arguments, but the one that remains is um, still this, the, the way that it explains um, the election is that we were all lost and that just some were taken. Yeah. And your explanation about faith is a good one, I've not used that one. Um, but anything else to counteract that? I've used all those arguments, but there's got to be another one. <laughs> <laughs> about election. He's got, he's got uh, believes in Israel, then Hamburgs, etc., 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 just this okay. chosen. Do you want to answer or you want me to answer? Go ahead, I'll, I'll pick it back on yours. The word electos, in Greek, is never used about an individual other than Christ. You are not elect, I am not elect. We are elect. A Jew is not elect because he's a Jew. A Jew is elect because the nation Israel is elect. A believer is never elected individually. It is the faithful church that is the elect. It is not always used in the plural, never in the singular for anybody except for Christ. Okay? If you're in the boat, you're part of the elect. You jump out of the lifeboat, you're not. You don't get in the lifeboat, you're not. You hop into the lifeboat, you are. It's like a superannuation scheme or an insurance policy. You pay your premiums, you're covered. You don't, tough luck. Don't get sick in the Philippines. <laughs> I want to go there. That's sweet. from experience, Jacob. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. It's always plural. It's the church that's elect. It's Israel that's elect. An individual is never guaranteed election unless he is part or she is part of the elect. It is never a personal election. It is always the church, 
It is always corporate. Does that help you understand? I think the other important thing, just taking on what Jacob says, beautiful word in the New Testament, in Christ, in Christ. We are elect, every, anyone's elect, in Christ. Once you're in Christ, you're elect. You can make a case from Ephesians once that there's only one elect, Jesus. That's right. If you're in him, you're elect. That's right. You're not in him, you're not. That's exactly right. That's exactly correct. Makes all the difference in the world. Yes. How do you get in Christ, though? That's the question. <laughs> the gospel. Believe, repent, receive. You in Christ, you're elect. Amen. Outside of Christ, there's no election. So it, it, it boils down to very simple. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it in you. Yes. Calvary says, see, that's you, that's you. <clears throat> verse 1 and verse 2. Paul, uh, Paul to Timothy, bondservant of Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Grace to you, plural. He who began a good work in you, plural. It's not talking to an individual. It's talking to the church, the body of Christ. Now, when you get to Timothy and Titus, you don't have those plural now because he's talking to an individual, but you don't find verses like that. You find verses that warn individuals about staying in the faith and yep. keeping in the faith, which are different than how Paul yep. directs the body of Christ. So are you elect? Yes. In Christ. Amen. Only in Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We have a break now or coffee or what do we do? <laughs> Lunch. We were going to go into what do you think? Well, how, to, how much time do we have left? Lunch is 1 p.m. What time is it now, please? 11.30. 11.30. Oh, we have time to continue. Okay, so half an hour. We'll have one more question, and then we will... There's no coffee now. Is there better? Uh, yeah, There's coffee. There's still coffee. One more question. We have a coffee break, and then Mark is going to speak. Colin? Louder, please. Give him a mic. The lady who was talking about grace and your answer to her, and the fact that you, felt, you said that the pastor probably doesn't understand faith either. Can I suggest that no, it's, it's probably not the right thing to say, but most of us have difficulty finding good churches. And if the fundamentals are wrong, would it not be fairer to warn the young lady to perhaps seek somewhere else to go? Because yeah, I told her I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I wouldn't be in a church like that, no. Can, can I give some advice as a pastor, if you can allow me to say this? Yeah. Stop looking for church buildings. Yes. Look for Christians. Look yes. for believers, like-minded believers. Yeah. The idea of uh, the church down the street from your house and the little Methodist church that, you know, with good pastors and things like that, there's still good ones, but not as many. We have people in our church that travel an hour, an hour and a half. They pass about 300 churches on the way to our church. Not because we're so great, it's because they find that we just are teaching the scriptures and giving the word of God and we love evangelism, we love Israel, we want to uh, keep the gospel going. And they, they, they can find a church near their, their home, just, but they just can't stay there because they're fundamentally, and in many ways, not like-minded, they, they, they deny a lot of things at the churches that they found, and, and they're very militant about other things. So if you disagree with something that they have, uh, you're automatically cast out or second-class citizen. I know people that are not pre-tribulationists, uh, wonderful believers who go to pre-tribulationist focused church, which I don't understand how you can get a pre-tribulationist church, since that's not such a fundamental doctrine, but they make it out that way, and they're treated as second-class citizens, yes. second-class Christians. Oh, yeah. oh, they're the, they're the non-pre-trip people. I said, well, James says not to do that. James says don't play favorites in the church, but they've done that. So my, my recommendation to anyone um, is to find believers. Don't try to find a church. It may not exist in your area, and you'll be frustrated, and you will be almost despondent, and you're going to be depressed because you're looking for a building, and you're looking for a steeple, and you're looking for a cross on the roof, and that, that we have to change as, a, as Americans, myself, and as Br uh, British. You have to think about yourself as a, not a, you have to see yourself as a fisherman now. You have to see yourself as an evangelist in your own country. You have to see yourself as a, somebody who seeks the lost and meet with other believers in order to do that. Uh, but the idea of just being in a church setting and in that kind of environment, it's changed. 
and it's changed right under our noses. And our grandfathers didn't have to think like that, our parents didn't have to think like that, but because society has changed, we have to see ourselves. I have to look at myself, yes, I'm a shepherd by God's calling and grace, but I also have to think that in my own country, I'm an evangelist, I'm a missionary in my own country because of how much has changed. And I, uh, I have great believers and wonderful believers, but it's taken some time to be around each other. Uh, but we found each other. God put us, uh, put us together. God's gonna do the same thing here. God's gonna do the same thing with you. So if you're frustrated without a church, look for believers. If you have to drive an hour, an hour and a half, I'm not saying it's, a, it's, it's the, the, the glorious thing yep. to do, but it may have to be yep. what God has for you. Yeah. It's like the Church of Acts. They did, meet, they did meet in temples, and then the temple, and kind of like here, we meet gatherings like that. But then from house to house, meeting together, yeah. fellowship, yeah. fellowship, fellowship, fellowship. Don't just go to church service. Look for fellowship with believers that are lasting, yeah. long-lasting relationships with one another. You're going to need them. You're going to need them.